this is why more and more syndicators, and at least in our experience, we speak to syndicators all the time on podcasts and in, in, in conversations. It's really popular, right? They, they want to be able to bring everybody along into the next deal with them, right? So 1031 Exchange is a great tool for that. So that's excellent. Yeah, I've definitely seen it advertised more and more uh, from syndicators. So, so I... I Really happy to have you guys on because I wanted to clear some of that up because I, I don't want people thinking that they can just get in, take their money, put right. it in, and then end up in a situation where they end up owing these capital gains yeah. um, and they never realized that just because yeah. <laughs> um, they didn't follow the rules, right? Because the rules are pretty complex from what you guys just walked through. I mean, you just have to follow the right steps and have the right guidance, right? So I want to make sure that that we get into some of the some of the nuts and bolts of the 1031, you know, some of the rules and guidelines so folks really understand cuz I know that there are pretty strict time constraints and so if you guys could elaborate on some of those for the for the group I'd appreciate that. I'll start out with that. So essentially part of the challenge of the 1031 exchange is the guidelines and the time frame. Um, you need to know two specific timelines, 45 and 180. All right, uh, if you're into geometry, maybe that'll make it a little bit easier, 45 degree angle and 180. So what essentially you're looking at is 45 days to identify replacement properties from the time of closing. All right, so essentially you've, you've sold the, the property has been sold, the QI has received funds, the clock is, is not running. You have 45 days to identify your placement properties. And typically, the, those are three properties of any value, right? You can pick this. So essentially, if you have sold a million dollars worth of beautiful Indianapolis properties, right? And you are going to reinvest the proceeds of that, you can choose one property in Indianapolis, one property that's a million dollars in Kansas City, one property that's in Florida, that's a million dollars, not a problem, right? And then you have 180, 180 oh. days from, again, from the sale to close on a property. Now, it's really important to know this is that you want to reinvest all of the proceeds oh. because any proceeds that are not reinvested, they're considered boot. I, I, you know, why is it called boot? Is there an analogy to some football reference? We don't know, but it's called boot. <laughs> and that is going to be taxed at capital gains tax, right? So, uh, so those are the two important timelines. Uh, Mike, maybe you can share um, about more than three properties and also Corona uh, guidelines. Yeah, so the typical, most investors we recommend, they only identify three because it's very simple. You know, as Alex said, you don't have to worry about values or anything like that. If you identify more than three, and you would typically only do that if you were going to buy a bunch of smaller properties. So as Alex said, you sold for a million dollars and you were going to build up a portfolio of several, mm -hmm. you know, $250,000 properties. Um, then you might want to identify more than three. And if you do that, you're limited to identifying properties that total uh, less than 200% of the value of what you sold. So if you sold for two million, for a million and you identified four properties, you're limited to $2 million total value of what you identify. Okay. Um, you can exceed that if you wanted to buy a big portfolio of properties that is going to be an all or nothing transaction. So you're going to buy 10 properties and you knew you were getting all 10 or you're getting zero. You could do that as well, as long as you buy 95% of the value of what you identified. So again, you can sell for a million, you identify a portfolio versus t worth 10 million. That's fine as long as you buy 900, uh, I'm sorry, 9.5 million dollars <laughs> of uh, property in that portfolio. Okay, 95% of the 10 million. So even if, um, you, even if you're, you're sitting on a million dollars, uh, of gains that you want to put forward, then if you identify, you said like the, the 10 million, you still have to purchase the nine and a half. You can't just out of that, take the million and, and put that forward. Well, you could, if you only identified three properties, oh, right? Okay. So yeah, if you, you know, so if you knew there was one $10 million property you were going to buy that, you know, or, and you identified three of them, three $10 million properties, you only bought one, which would be kind of hard to do without additional cash. Um, you know, you could do that. It's only if you exceed those three properties. And that's only if you knew you were going to buy a portfolio, like one seller is going to sell you 10 properties worth $10 million or something like that. You know, that's the only time you would use what we call the 95% rule. But typically we recommend you stick to the three property rule. Um, just quickly on the COVID-19 update. Um, you know, they've extended the time for people to pay and file their tax returns for 2019 to Jan July 15th. 
they did the same thing with 1031 exchanges. So if you have a deadline, a 1031 exchange deadline that falls between April 1st and July 15th, it has automatically been extended to July 15th. We think there might be a basis to say that you get an additional extension of 120 days if you don't fall in that guideline, uh, or even if you do. Uh, but that hasn't been proven yet, and we're waiting for guidance from the IRS on that question. And we've also, as an industry, that Federation of Exchange Accommodators I mentioned is teamed up with other groups like the National Association of Realtors and some other ICSE, I believe, was part of the groups that involved. Um, to lobby the IRS for further relief. The American Bar Association also has lobbied the IRS for further relief, recognizing that this pandemic is ongoing. And even if you get closed today on a 1031 exchange, July 15th doesn't do much for you. You might need extensive you know, time right. to go beyond that. So maybe 120 days is a more fair, uh, 20 day extension is a more fair uh, timeline. Gotcha. Do, do you have any sense of when or if further guidance comes out on that? 120 days. I was hoping it would. I was hoping it was going to be every day up until today, and it hasn't been. So, uh, <laughs> okay. you know, the IRS has had their hands full with the PPP loans, and mm -hmm. you know they have a whole bunch of other stuff. So they're they're, you know, to their credit, they're doing yeoman's labor these days, and hopefully they'll get around to us very very shortly. So we have some guidance for our clients. Gotcha. So uh, we understand the timelines. Uh, we understand that you've got to stick within those. I mean. Are there other things that people need to be keeping in mind that that could cause their 1031 to be unsuccessful? Um, yeah, well, one thing about the, that identification period is, you know, so once the 45 days expires, you are stuck with whatever you identified. So you do not have to have a contract in the 45 days, but it's a really good idea. You want to have those bound up as and negotiated as much as you possibly can. If possible, you'd love to get due diligence done in that 45 days too, because you don't want to be on day 90 and all of a sudden run a phase one on your property, phase one environmental inspection, you find out that's on a Superfund site, right? Because mm -hmm. um, then you're stuck. You don't have, you, maybe you could go to one of your backups if you have backups, but maybe not. So, you know, and you want to, you want to start shopping as soon as you list your property for sale. And how does the identification period work? Go, going back to trying to invest in a syndication. So if you were going to, you're going to sell your property, you want to go into a syndication, how does the identification period work in that? Do you have to identify three different syndications to invest in? Yeah, you would. You would have, they'd have to be specific properties, right? Because you're not buying actually a syndication in that case. You're buying a tenant in common interest. Sure. And so not only are you do you have to identify, you know, one, two, three Main Street in Indianapolis, such a property exists, but you have to identify what percentage interest you're going to buy in that property as well. So you would have to say, not that I'm buying one, two, three Main Street in Indianapolis, you know, you'd have to say I'm buying a five percent interest in one, two, three Main Street in Indianapolis. You know, you have a little bit of wiggle room, sure. uh, but you want to be as close as you possibly can. Understood. So, so again, it does add an extra layer of complication. You do have to be working very closely with the syndicator up front. Yes. And it sounds like not just one syndicator, you would have to, unless the single syndicator could have three properties. It's just the number of properties is really what you're going after right. in the identification period. And you don't have to identify three. If you know that you're going to buy that one syndication, you know, then just identify that one. You know, you may want to have some backups in case it falls through if, you know, for whatever reason. Uh, there's some other things out there uh, that are good backups, which we can get into, but uh, other products out there, but you want to kind of get, get it done as fast as possible. So you don't have to identify three. No. But if you only identify one, you have to move forward with that one. So if you, if you get past the 45 days and you, then you say, oh, actually, I don't want to invest in that one, are you just dead in the water at that point? Yes. No, no. So I, I, I think just to clarify, I think I understand Ken's question a little differently and just make sure. Ken, you mean once you identify a property, do you, are you forced to buy it? Is that what you're asking? No, but if you don't buy it, then you can't go get another property, right? Essentially yes. you've lost your ability to do a 1031 right. exchange. Yes. And then, and then right. you are going to be liable in the capital gains tax. Right. Exactly. Okay. Yeah, no, that, that's, that, that makes sense. So, so it's important to identify multiple. Um, they don't all have to be, I mean, they, they can be all different kinds, as you said, but three seems to be that magic number. Um, I, th I think it would be interesting. You sit, you, you kind of alluded to Mike that there's, there's some fallbacks, maybe some other options. I mean, what, what would those be for investors? Yeah. So there's something out there called a Delaware statutory trust. Okay. So 
and, and this is kind of a take on that tech structure we talked about. And now it's similar to a syndicated deal in some ways, but essentially, usually you'll have institutional property. It's bought by, it's not a REIT, but you know, some you know, real estate management type companies will go out and buy a property. Two of the biggest ones in this industry are Inland Capital and Pasco. You know, there's a handful of others. Cantor Fitzgerald is in this space. You know, there's a couple of those types of mm-hmm. institutions. Um, so they will buy a property. It could be anything. It could be a shopping center. It could be a retirement community. It could be, you know, multifamily. It could be self-storage. You know, it's really any sector. They buy a property and they put it into a trust, a land trust, usually formed under Delaware law, thus the Delaware Statutory Trust. They then, under a rev ruling that came out in 2004, can sell off beneficial interests in the trust to 1031 exchange investors. Okay, so in this case, it's like we said, you can't, you know, we said before, you have to buy a deeded property interest. This is the exception. You can buy an interest in the trust and that will qualify. It's as if you bought the underlying property as almost like a tick. Okay, and these were structured as ticks up until uh, the financial collapse of 2008 and then they moved more into this, this structure. And that will qualify for 1031 purposes. So you get out of the, it's like a syndicated deal. You're away from the three T's, the 10's trash in the toilets. Um, they're not, you know, like kind of like a syndicated deal. They're not that liquid. So you're not just going to sell it, you know, a year from now. You're going to have to wait till the entire property sells. And then you're eligible and you could go to another exchange. But they allow you to diversify because they, you could buy several DSTs in different property sectors or areas of the country. You can kind of tailor your investment. So if you, you know, let's say you you sold for a million dollars and you found a property you really like for seven hundred thousand, but you had three hundred thousand dollars of cash left over, well, you could roll that excess into a DST to complete your exchange, um, and you know, or you, you could um, you know just choose it as a standalone. This is the property you want. You want to get out of the management. Uh, you do have to be an accredited investor, which is not that unusual in in these types of deals. Uh, meaning that you have to have uh, income of two hundred, I think it's two hundred thousand uh, dollars. I always get them messed up. It's two hundred or two fifty as a single person, and three hundred thousand dollars as a married couple filing jointly for the t- prior two years, uh, or have a million dollars in net worth excluding the value of your primary residence. So for accredited investors, that's a, an option as either a backup or even as a standalone. And this Delaware statute, Delaware statutory trust is a, it's a benefit because it's something that that exists that can always be invested in. So it's it's not something where you have to align a property necessarily. Is that right? Like the, Correct. Pro- so, the property yeah. can exist, other people are invested in it and you, and you can essentially add to that. It's kind of like a, like a mutual fund, if you will. In a way, yeah, in a way. So the property exists, it's already, and that was the advantage over a tech structure where you had to buy in, you had could have up to 30 people investing in a tech, but they all had to close on the same day. Right, right here, the property exists. You can close whenever it, it makes sense for you. You know, I mean, they do sell out, you know, so if they sell out, then you would maybe have to buy somebody's interest who's in the project, which is a little bit more difficult, but sure. Um, but typically, you know, if not this DST, there may be others, right? There's, there's a steady supply of DSTs on the market. Gotcha. Well, I, th- I think that's a great fact for investors and, and yeah. a good alternative for folks uh, that are coming up on the 45 day deadline. Yeah. So we it, do have a lot it, of people do them last minute. Yeah. Is it something that if you're, you know, you, you've maybe identified two properties and, and then can you identify a DST as that third option? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. So, so that then it can really play as a fallback if the, sure. the others don't work out. Okay. No, thanks. That's very helpful. Awesome. You guys have provided some fantastic info for, for somebody that's, you know, we, we covered a lot of, of dense information. Let, let's take it back up to the top for a second. Say for somebody that's, you know, just getting into investing in real estate, that they're looking at deals, they're trying to understand how the process works. They, they've heard about 1031s mm-hmm. and, and, and there's a lot to unpack, right? I mean, what, what's the one thing that they should really take away today? Yeah, I think Alex said it earlier, you know, you don't want the tax tail to wag the dog. You know, you, you're better off paying taxes than making a bad investment because you know how much you're going to pay in taxes. You don't know how much you can lose in making a bad investment. You know, I'd rather take the third, one third, you know, haircut on my profit than lose everything. So, you know, due diligence is key. You know, I can't stress that enough. I mean, Alex and I say it over and over again. 
you know, make sure you, you know what, and also if you're doing a syndicated deal, make sure you know who you're doing business with, right? Because no matter what's on paper, it's really important to find good people. And if you find good people, then the paper doesn't matter. People are going to do the right thing. Yeah, I think that's fantastic advice. So to, to round the show out, we like to do a segment called Keys to Success. Uh, I have a few questions I'd love to ask you guys, starting with if you could only, as a passive investor, if you could only ask your sponsor one question, what should that one question be? I like to know track record. You know, what have you done? What have, what have you done before? It's no guarantee, but you know, if somebody successfully has managed, you know, properties, you know, for years, you know, you can kind of work off that track record and then hope that that continues. And particularly if you're dealing with people who have been around long enough that they've survived a downturn you know, and how, how they treated their investors during the downturn. Alex, what do you think? Yeah, I think what Mike has just said exactly. You know, it's having someone with experience is really, really crucial. Or, uh, you know, it's, you know, I think that in, at least initially, uh, the syndicators usually have conversations with people that are close to them. Right? So usually friends, family, neighbors, right? So I think you just want to make sure that you trust the person, right? That's really, really crucial, right? So what, whatever questions you think are best in determining trust of an individual, that's the ones that you should be asking because you're investing into the person as much as you are in the property. That's exactly right. And what are you most proud of? Uh, for me, it's my kids. You know, my, my three boys, we were talking earlier, you know, I have three boys who are all adults now, um, you know, at various stages of their life, you know, finding jobs in college, you know, and at the end of the day, that's all important. You want your kids to succeed and achieve. But the one thing I can point to with my kids that I am most proud is that I raised three good people. You know, they all have hearts of gold. They all, you know, go out of their way to, I see them with like, they're my younger nephews. You know, they're just good people with, you know, the younger kids. They're always, you know, they're people who are out in the world looking to help other people. I have an English teacher uh, as my oldest. I have a son who's in business. It helps, you know, hospitals with um, um, save money on, in, in their, their service contracts and things like that and supplies. And my youngest is, is in college now and is, uh, is a, college soccer player, but has always been, and all my kids have been involved in coaching and sports and, and helping kids who are younger than them kind of learn the ropes. And so that, that's, I can't say enough about having good people. I mean, we were having produced good people, despite maybe some of my best efforts to screw them up. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's the most important thing. I, I, I'll say that uh, just because Mike, uh, we can't be proud of the same thing. So I'm going to, uh, I'll say that, of course, my children, they're still very young. So we'll see how that, <laughs> I, I don't have the track record yet, but Mike has, <laughs> I'm still in the process, right? So I don't know, you know, I will say, I think that uh, there are several uh, individuals that my previous company has employed that I think uh, really turned their life around. There are individuals who were, um, you know, the, the statistics would point that they would not be able to turn their life around and have to go back to jail. And I think having the environment that we set up, well, you know, two people specifically come to mind that were, you know, it was really their last chance. If they were going to make another mistake, there was going to be their third strike. And I think we, uh, we gave an environment and a job for people that other people would not provide jobs for. And uh, it, was, it, was a, it was a very special company. So I'm, I'm very proud of some of the results that we have in changing people's lives. That's an excellent service. It's a great, and, <clears throat> excuse me, and a great story. Uh, what's the the book that everyone should be reading? So I'll start. I think that one of the partners that we ignore in a lot of the deals, or is our spouse. So as many business, assuming you present as a spouse, right? I'm gonna make the assumption. Uh, you know, I think it's really one of the books that helped us a lot. My, my wife and I is uh, Getting the Love You Want. Uh, it's an excellent book and kind of gives you a little bit of insight about why you choose the person you're going to marry. And uh, it's a really, really crucial. It's really, really crucial as you're building a, a generational wealth philosophy that you're, you and your spouse are aligned. So working in your marriage as much as, uh, uh, as on your business is really crucial. Good advice. Yeah, I want to put a plug in very briefly for Moby Dick. <laughs> oh, Moby Dick is, is one of the one of the, but I'm going to move on from that. But Moby Dick is such a great piece of American fiction that I, I think 
you know, to kind of get an understanding of this country and, and, uh, you know, I, I, and I'm very into the sea and the ocean and all that. I'm a paddle boarder. And so, you know, I, I love that stuff, but you know, on the business sense, um, there's, there's a couple of books out there. Um, uh, Eckhart Tolle's book is fantastic, but you know, I think, um, uh, seven habits of highly effective people is just one I keep falling back on, you know, uh, for business purposes. If you look and you read that book and it talks about the importance of education and kind of time management, you know, it's, it's all in there. It's an old one, but it's, it's something that I read, you know, periodically and I've read several times. It's a great choice, Mike. Great. And the last question, what's your number one key to success? Well, I, I'll, I'll go with, <laughs> My number one key to success is Michael. Uh, uh, no, I will say You're that. You're making me cry. No, but I, what, what I will say is that uh, mentorship is really crucial, right? Working with someone that has a, as much experience he, as he does in this area. And I'm not, I'm, Mike is an example of a mentor, but I've tried to have mentors in, in my marriage and my raising my children and my spiritual life. Um, I think that that's, uh, that's a really crucial thing is that uh, having people in your life that you can really honestly talk to in different areas and or specialists who have a track record. Um, I, would highly, I would highly encourage people are so disconnected and, and advice is so generalized that unless someone can know you and you're given station, you're missing out. So that's, that's, my, uh, that's my one key that I have. Yeah, I appreciate that, Alex. Uh, for, for me, I, I think it's, it's having, uh, I, I think, you know, so I talked about highly effective, seven habits of highly effective people. And there's a, if you spend a lot of time on LinkedIn, like Alex and I do, there's a lot of people that talk about time management. And, you know, I see a lot of these people. And I, the one thing I often see that scares me is that a lot of people are too dedicated to their businesses. Um, and I think you have to have something outside of making money and work that drives you, you know, so we talked about, you know, for, I think the three of us, right. Our kids, our family are so, so important, but you also have to have outside interests. You have to have some things that kind of recharge your battery. And for me, you know, an exercise regime has been very important throughout my career. I've been a runner since I was in high school. I still run, you know, four to six days a week. It, it kind of, you know, clears my head, uh, makes me more, more productive through the day, but more importantly, I, I just enjoy it. I enjoy that kind of that time outside and, and in uh, being in nature. Likewise, as I mentioned, I paddleboard too, I, when the weather permits, you know, and, uh, you know, both of those two things together and then the other activities that I do kind of drive me, kind of let me recharge my battery, reset, and just, you know, add purpose and value to, to living. If I might. That's great. No, I think that those are awesome keys to success. I think both are extremely important. And what's yours? How's and yours? You're the first one to ask me that. Look at this. My my key to success is, um, well, I mean, honestly, to play off of you guys, I mean, men mentorship. I've had mentors in, in various aspects of my life that have propelled me faster and further than I ever thought I would be. So mentorship, I can't go beyond that. I also one of mine is meditation. So kind of like exercise, um, but just spending that time each day to get focused. Um, you know, quiet your mind helps me stay, um, helps me stay engaged, stay present and, and be able to really, uh, hone in on what's important. So meditation. Is it an app or, or is it sub guy that I use headspace. headspace um, yeah. I, okay. You know, I, I've used a few, um, I have done it on my own as well. The reason I like headspace is because it, it tracks it for you, makes it very easy you know, it's not something you, you have to think about. You just go in every day and, and you're able to kind of update and it keeps track of how many minutes you've done it and, and all that good stuff. So there's some kind of gaming to it. But yeah, it's uh, that that has been extremely valuable for me over the past few years. As, as my life continues to get crazier, that's the thing that helps me kind of stay centered and uh, and maintain. No, that's great because I'm terrible at meditation. I mean, I, I get into a meditative state through running, but sitting and meditating, I'm really bad at. So I'll have to check that out. Yeah, it's you know, it's something that you could start for just five minutes or, or even one minute. You know, you just, you sit there and you, and you and you concentrate on on your breath, and, and that's really all it is. It, it, there's no right or wrong way to it, right. and uh, but it's something that that yeah. If I find if I don't do it for a while, I actually get 
like almost a little anxious about being, Oh, I have to sit down for like 15 minutes, <laughs> you know, right. but, but your brain, you know, you, you have to kind of unwind things and then you start to actually look forward to it and, and, and you can use it as part of your process. So yeah, I would highly recommend it. Yeah, that's great. Uh, well, thank you guys so much for being here today. I, I think to, to summarize things quickly, some of my big takeaways were just because you're a qualified intermediary doesn't mean you're necessarily qualified. You know, <laughs> as an investor, you, you need to be doing your due diligence on the organization and making sure that the organization truly has uh, the expertise and the technology uh, and the know-how that, that you guys obviously displayed here today. So I appreciate that. Um, don't let the tail wag the dog, right? It's better, like we said a couple of times, to pay the taxes then push yourself in, into a poor investment just right. to just to save on that. Um, as we think about being limited partners and investing in syndications, it's important to understand what a, what a drop and swap is. Um, there, it is possible to get into a syndication using a 1031, but it takes a lot of upfront planning and you, and you have to have a, a syndicator who, who's willing to work with you in a tenant in common relationship, right? So, so while it is possible, it's definitely more difficult and, and it takes some, some additional conversations. And, um, and then we learned about Delaware statutory trust, which I didn't know about. So I appreciated that, uh, that extra information is kind of the, the fallback to using the 1031 to make sure that, that you are able to save on those taxes if, if you haven't identified a good property. So a lot of great information today, guys. I really appreciate you being on the show. And last but not least, how can folks reach out to you if they want to learn more about what you guys do and about 1031s? Yeah. So for me, email is typically best. I'm really good at getting back on my email. Unfortunately, I look at it too often. Um, I haven't figured out that that four hour work week yet that uh, Tim Ferriss talks about. I look at my email all the time. Uh, but I, you can reach me at mbrady at madison1031.com. I'm also on LinkedIn, so you can always look me up there. And Alex? Yeah, the best way to reach me is through LinkedIn. So that's a great platform to reach out to me. Great. I'll make sure we include that in the show notes for you guys. But thanks again. Alex, Mike, thanks for being on the show. A ton of great info. And with that, we'll sign off. And now I hope that you all can take this info and go out and passively invest like a pro.